Hello, welcome. It's uh, John Florescu. I'm here in Bucharest. And tonight's guests are one in Madrid and one in California. I will introduce uh, first the one near, near to me is Sorin Ducaro, who most people know as, well, for many reasons, but one, he was U.S. ambassador um, in, uh, I think it was in the two, early 2000, 2001 to 2006. And then he was ambassador at NATO in 2006, I think went from United States to NATO. And now he's director of the European Union Satellite Center in Madrid. Did I get all those facts right? Yes, I was Romanian ambassador to the United States, not oh, US yeah. ambassador. So yeah, just yeah. to make the clear point. Yeah. And he was my, my brother's boss, I remember too, <laughs> from Hurricane <laughs> Katrina. Very close friend of your brother, of yourself, and all the great Romanian Americans that I have a chance to meet. Thank, thank you very much. And then uh, Dr. Virgil Gligo, who's from Zalao, a city I visited recently, and I found it very interesting. And he was born in Zalao in 1949. He is a expert, the more technical person for today's guest. And he was educated at the University of California in Brooklyn. I think you got all your degrees there right. in California. And then went on to uh, University of Maryland and Carnegie Mellon, which is in Pittsburgh, I believe, right? Correct. That's where I'm now. That's where you're in, in Pittsburgh, right? Yeah. And you're co-director of the, is it called SciLab? Yes, was for seven years. Oh, was, okay, for seven years. Anyways, I'm delighted to have you both and thank you for coming. Uh, today's discussion is a very hot topic and always in the news, and we try to be, keep close to the news. The actual headline is cy uh, cyber attacks from the East, are the rascals outsmarting the sheriffs. It's a provocative title and maybe a, a somewhat an unbalanced title, but I thought I'd start with a simple question is, and I'll uh, allow Adi to step forward, what is cyber warfare? Could you give us an idea? What are we talking about? Uh, maybe I'll go first to, to Virgil um, on, in the United States. Well, so, uh, so basically, uh, the notion of warfare, uh, in, a not in any notion of warfare, you have at least one attacker and at least one defender. So uh, as an analogy, uh, and perhaps a provocative one, people have used this notion of warfare as applied to the cyber realm. So view uh, the warfare as being an entity that's being attacked by an external adversary. Um, and now this can take a variety of uh, instantiations or incarnations. So for example, the external adversary could be a nation state. Uh, would, could be a, an organization of a nation state, could be a subcontractor of a nation state, uh, could be a nation state coming under false flag. For example, what that means is that, uh, say you may have a Russian intelligence officer operating out of Shanghai, uh, masquerading as a, as a Chinese uh, attacker of a group of Chinese attackers. So that's on the attack side. On the defense side, you basically have large government organizations, you have corporations, you have individuals. So when you talk about cyber warfare, however, people have in mind nation states against nation states. Although, although the definition of cyber warfare really applies even at the micro level, one individual against another. I see. Well, you mentioned the large government organization. So, Serene, I turn that over to you, since you represent the interest of the a large organization, uh, NATO. Can we get your characterization of that or your answer to the question? Sure. Uh, let me follow on on what um, uh, Virgil has said, uh, um, because there's a difference between warfare and confrontation. Uh, what he mentioned could be applied to confrontation, but warfare means going beyond a certain threshold. Uh, and in conceptual terms, uh, this threshold um, uh, or the difference between warfare and, and peace, uh, which is also reflected uh, uh, at, in the U UN Charter, um, is the so-called armed attack. So once there is an armed attack, we can enter the area of war, of warfare. That's the difference between war and peace in accordance with uh, uh, 
UN uh, okay. Charter and the, the, the UN um, ecosystem. The problem is that nowadays uh, with uh, cyber uh, attacks and with uh, other types of, um, um, I would say, uh, new new types uh, of, of, uh, of attacks, this threshold between war and peace gets blurred. And it doesn't just create a problem uh, related to defending and so on. It creates a, a conceptual problem and it creates a systemic problem. What kind of regime needs to be created in order to deter uh, the kind of attacks that uh, cannot be defined uh, very easily or straightforward as armed um, uh, attacks. Now, um, there was a big debate in NATO about this. And I should remind uh, you that uh, uh, although uh, we speak of uh, the, the famous uh, cyber attacks against Estonia in 2007, which triggered the debate in NATO, it was just one year after I arrived on the North Atlantic Council. It was only um, in 2014 that uh, NATO linked cyber defense with Article 5, with collective defense, uh, stating that um, a cyber attack could uh, have the effects of a conventional attack or another or, 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 or an typical armed attack. And therefore, uh, this would, uh, I would say, legitimize allies to respond um, as in a situation of, of, of uh, armed attack uh, uh, in, in under collective under Article 5. So to make a long story short, I think when uh, a cyber attack reaches the threshold that generates really dramatic effects, like a conventional uh, attack uh, implicating um, you know, casualties, uh, loss of life, uh, significant loss of, uh, of property, uh, of uh, uh, disruptions and, and so on and, and so forth, uh, infrastructure, uh, then uh, it could be defined um, as an armed attack and then we can, we can really enter the area of warfare. Let me mention that so far, we did not have an, a, a, a cyber warfare, according to this, this debate, this discussion that we're we are having. You know, there was a lot of discussion about cyber per harbor and so on. And I think one of the arguments or one of the advantages that, that we did not have, or, or, or the reasons why we did not have a, a kind of a warfare type, cyber warfare or cyber per harbor is exactly because um, both uh, NATO and a number of other um, nations on the international scene uh, decided that if a cyber attack would generate effects of a, another type of attack, then it would be legitimate to respond with all means possible, not just with cyber means, but also with, of course, from political means, uh, sanctions, but up to military means. So a cyber attack in this definition would warrant or be justified to be responded with the military potentially. Well, cyber attacks are attacks and attacks. If a cyber attack can be defined as an armed attack, yeah. so a weapon created to generate destructive effects, the effect element is here, the kind of uh, element that is defined, then it, it could be uh, considered as an act of war. When you uh, you mentioned there Estonia in 2014, in fact, I think that was the year of the Sony. No, 2007 hack. Estonia. Oh, 2007. This there, I remember it sort of came to the public notice. I remember when Sony Corporation was attacked in 2014. And then I think it was Equifax in 2017 when people's identities, almost 150 million, came up in the surface. Um, Virgil, let me ask you, yeah. what, can you explain a little bit of the anatomy of an attack? The phishing. Sure. How does how does it work? How does it actually how do these how does this happen? Sure. So I'll I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. But before I do that, let me uh, uh, re-emphasize uh, this notion that when we talk about cyber warfare, we make an analogy with the real world, mm -hmm. uh, because cyber is now the fifth domain after the land, sea, air, and space. So people adopted this analogy with good reason. However, there is a big difference in addition to the one that Ambassador Dugaru mentioned. And the big difference is that in the cyberspace, very often you do not know who the adversary is. There is no attribution. 
right? There is only one organization worldwide that I know about that has very accurate attribution. And it's very expensive to use that organization. But other than that, most people have no idea where the adversary, uh, who the adversary is. So you don't know whom to respond to. But now what an attack, what's an attack? I mean, how, how do people define the attacks? What, what's a cyber attack? So it turns out that a cyber attack would be viewed very simply as a triple. One is the goal, the definition of the goal of the adversary. What is the adversary after? What is the gain? Uh, the attack has to have a, a purpose, right? Like exfiltration of information, destruction of information, uh, theft of uh, data, personal uh, accounts, money, and so on. Secondly, what are the capabilities employed in the attack? What are the cyber capabilities? In other words, uh, what does the adversary utilize? Can the adversary send messages? Can the adversary replay network messages? Can the adversary exploit a particular vulnerability in an operating system, uh, a wrong password? Again, what are the adversary's capabilities? And third is what are the adversary's strategies? How does the adversary employ the capabilities to achieve the goal. Now, I can give you a, a number of examples of attacks. For example, you mentioned the uh, Russian attack against Estonia uh, in 2007, and that was a so-called denial of service attack. So what that meant is that uh, the adversary uh, flooded. So the, the target was to disrupt government computer systems to make them crash. So what the adversary did, namely uh, the, uh, the Russians did, they flooded the network accesses uh, to all these government servers in Estonia. So all of the sudden, the, all the servers or most of the servers in the Estonian government crashed. And uh, they launched this attack repeatedly over a period of about a day or two until presumably the uh, Estonian government was supposed to get the message. Never move a statue of a Soviet soldier who uh, liberated you in a different place, right? Yeah. So it was a political goal. The goal of the adversary was a political message. It was not exfiltration of money, it was not theft of data, personal property and so on was basically a political goal. And they ex exercised the capabilities of flooding. The denial of service attack was through flooding the servers. And the strategy was that they employed that repeatedly. Um, sorry, so that's, that's what they did in that particular case. I mean, you mentioned uh, Estonia, which of course raises Russia. Uh, Serene, you're a diplomat, but I mean, essentially, are we talking about Russia and China as the offenders or the people most involved in this game? Oh, well, I have to say that there is a really diverse uh, set of, um, of players in this, um, in this field. Um, but um, it's indeed, there are a number of, of member states that have uh, capabilities and also strategies to employ um, um, cyber uh, attacks, and uh, uh, yes, of course, given my uh, my, my my position, I, I will not uh, enter into let's say uh, classified stuff or, or so on. But there's a lot of already uh, public acknowledgement of the level um, and and also um, attribution, including political attribution, vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, Russian and Chinese attacks. There are other uh, uh, potent players um, like um, uh, Iran or, or um, uh, North um, uh, Korea. Uh, there are also, um, uh, there, there's a whole, um, I would say dark uh, net or cyber uh, underground, which is quite um, uh, potent, especially in the, in the field of uh, cyber crime and ransomware and, and, and so on. Um, by the way, some of these ransomware tactics have been employed a lot also by, by North Korea in order to get resources for the, um, for the regime. So uh, to, to, um, uh, what, I would, what I would point um, is the following. We can speak of really different levels of, um, of attacks. And actually the, 
uh, attack against Estonia, the distributed denial of ser service of 2007, um, that which was described by Virgil uh, very clearly, uh, it would it would be one of the I would say most simple, sometimes called brute force um, attack because uh, you just want to uh, to clog the pipes to to, yeah. a, to a system. Yeah. Um, there, what, what I can say is that um, more um, uh, recently we can see uh, in uh, an increase in um, sophistication, intensity, and also. Um, continuity of endurance of such um, uh, attacks. Uh, uh, we are speaking the, 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 the buzzword for um, these more advanced attacks is so-called they are so-called APT or advanced persistent uh, uh, threats. And um, it is uh, uh, a number of, uh, of these uh, capable um, uh, actors and nations that uh, have the resources. Uh, to engage in, in, in such kind of um, uh, advanced persistence threat. That's why when we speak of cyber defense, there are a couple of um, uh, elements that have to do with technology, with people, with processes, politics, and sometimes even geopolitics. And there are a couple of aspects that technology and, and processes uh, uh, can solve, but at a certain level, uh, due to the engagement of uh, really potent players, this uh, is part of now a geopolitical uh, confrontation. And frankly, uh, technology is playing nowadays more and more uh, a role uh, in, in, in geopolitics. Uh, you know, we were talking in the past about geopolitics per se, geoeconomics as an element of geopolitics. There is there's a new concept that uh, uh, I, I actually have even wrote, uh, wrote about, and uh, uh, I think it's developing is a new discipline that I would call geotechnology, the impact of technology development of, uh, upon the geopolitical, uh, I would say, establishment. And the development of cyber attacks are really relevant to, to watch because they will be really giving us good examples to see how this confrontation evolves at strategic level. The, I mean, the economist was reporting, uh, I think about a month ago, the vulnerable sectors of the economy, which include oil pipelines, power plants, ports, banks, electrical grids. It sounds pretty bad. Is, is that an exaggeration? What, what's your feeling both on that? Uh, is, the, uh, is the West that vulnerable or for that matter, the East, if the United States is doing the same thing? Um, very much so. As a matter of fact, one of the things that you probably uh, uh, skipped, uh, I don't know if economists mentioned it either, was the water supply. You know, one of the most potent attacks is to turn off the chlorine uh, di dispensation, which is done through uh, computer system controls in the water supply. And then an entire city uh, gets very, very sick and there'll be lots of deaths, perhaps more so than if you attack the electric grid. But in any case, the uh, developed countries' infrastructures are extremely vulnerable. And uh, the, it's not just the developed system infrastructures, all infrastructures which are computing based are vulnerable. And why is that? All of them, without exception, use what I call commodity systems. These are the, the Mac systems, Mac OS, Unix, Windows boxes, uh, telephones and so on. Now, these commodity systems will always be insecure. Why is that? Well, there are three axioms of insecurity and very briefly uh, for commodity systems. The first one says that there will always be rapid innovation in software for commodity systems and rapid innovation will always cause insecurity. And why rapid innovation? because there is zero cost of entry or near zero cost of entry in the software business, almost zero regulation and zero liability. This produces fantastic innovation. This is absolutely great. Uh, we love this and we'd love to have as much innovation as possible, but we have to be aware that this always causes insecurity, okay? Why? Because security means very detailed, slow, careful analysis that takes years to do mathematical proofs of system software. 
So we'll never have commodity systems which are secure. All this infrastructure that you mentioned use commodity systems. So that's a bad news. Uh, there is another piece of bad news and then I'll give you the good news. <laughs> so the other piece of bad news is that there will always be this giant pieces of software, millions of lines of code controlling these systems. And no one on the face of the earth understands all the security properties of these giants, giant pieces of software. That's axiom number two. And axiom number three says that there will always be an adversary who would, for whatever reasons, political, social, economic reasons, military reasons, will be able to exploit axiom one and two. Okay, now that's a bad news. What's the good news? The good news is that research nowadays is developing techniques to use commodity systems and switch to secure modes of operations in the same commodity system. For example, I could click on a button uh, on the web browser and switch to a mode which cannot be attacked. Okay. I see. That is basically having our cake and eat it too. <laughs> yeah, I see. We'll never get rid of insecurity and commodity system, but we'll be able to live with insecurity and commodity systems. And I was very encouraged, by the way, by this center, uh, European Center for Cybersecurity in Bucharest, is that my, uh, my uh, call to arms to them was that in the next five to 10 years to actually demonstrate such invulnerable commodity system or invulnerable modes of operation in commodity systems. And I could give you examples, but this is well, research and it will be something that will happen in the next five to 10 years. Well, we, we remember in the United States maybe three months ago when Colonial Oil Company in Houston, Texas yeah. effect, effectively got shut down or slowed to a trickle as in Washington those days and the whole East Coast seemed to came to a, to a standstill to some extent. It led, what, what you're describing, let's say with water being even more menacing. Yeah. But I remember the, one of the points where the, they, they said that the colonial system was extremely unprepared in terms of its technology to fight against thing, fight against this kind of intrusion. Generally speaking, whether we're talking about colonial or in Europe, uh, Sorin, let's say in Sweden, we had the Swedish gross, grocery chain. And I think in Ireland, there was a case. Is it your view that these companies, now, now switching away from uh, nations, are under, under protected and vulnerable to continuing attacks. Sorin. Uh, well, to, 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 to kind of continue um, the point made by um, uh, Virgil, uh, he, he made this point that, uh, you know, we, we, we love uh, fast innovation uh, and um, sometimes cheap uh, innovation. Uh, always, because, always. You know, ev everything is, is driven by, by money and, and cost reduction. Um, I think we need to evolve towards a, a culture of a better balancing uh, the, um, um, I would say, uh, easy access and uh, the, the low cost with uh, the security. And security has a price and the price which is worth worth to play now all these examples that uh, that you gave from sweden to ireland to the united states really make the point that security deserves uh, a price um, uh, to pay so um i i, I do think that um, um what is needed and I, I know it's happening it's happening in europe um, and it's happening in the united states uh, the development of specific certifications of products in terms of cyber security in in europe it's the so-called enisa uh, european um, uh, network information security uh, agency um, there is an equivalent in the united states i i think i forgot the acronym um, uh, right now i know there are some who are fighting uh, against regulation and I'm all for, I mean, I'm also against excessive regulation, but uh, frankly, uh, there have, we have to agree to some minimum standards that would make uh, us as citizens, uh, companies uh, safe. And for that, we need a price to pay it. Which brings me 
to to another um, issue which uh, is an issue of uh, i would say um it's a so socio political um uh, issue uh, because there are two trends uh, in the world uh, right now uh, as much as um, there is complaint that we don't have enough safety standards for products for systems in the western world in the us in western europe and so on um, i have to tell you that there is a, a, a much faster trend of uh, for example very uh, accessible uh, low cost products uh, from um, china for example um, that are imported um, and and used uh, all over um, in, in different uh, uh, places, uh, and of course, um, no one is um, uh, claiming that they are um, uh, secure. Everyone advertises the low uh, price and uh, the utility, so I, I wouldn't say that um, uh, there is uh, any any cheating uh, here. It's just playing some uh, ignorance of those who are the, the recipients. Uh, the customer is, be they citizens, companies, or or nation states. So, to make a long story uh, uh, short, um, I, I think uh, there has to be uh, an increased awareness uh, of this kind of um, uh, of need, so that every company uh, has a certain uh, investment uh, in cybersecurity. Those who are investing most are banks, and um, uh, you know financial institutions. By the way, even they make a risk management calculation because, uh, like Virgil said, you cannot protect everything. There's no perfect protection, but yeah. uh, uh, they, they make sure absolute to, to a certain point they prefer to to pay the let's say the the price of a theft, but they don't uh, accept to pay uh, too high of a price. So they rather invest uh, uh, in uh, in secure systems uh, when when they speak about larger sums and and big investments and and so on. So. Uh, I think it's worse to learn from this risk management approach that financial institutions um, pursue. We were talking about sectors a moment ago, different sectors, and Virgil mentioned the thing about the water sector, which is a big one. But as a diplomat, let me ask you, Serene, again, when Joe Biden went to Geneva and met with Putin, and he listed 16, 16 industries, I guess, which he asked to be off limit, he don't touch them. Do you think that was a good idea? If I owned a sector in the 17th or anything above the 17th set, I'd be a little nervous. What did you think of that idea? Well, um, it's, you know, in, in the theory of um, uh, deterrence, because yeah. that message was a deterrence message from right. uh, yeah. President Biden. In the theory of deterrence, um, uh, it stated that you should always leave a certain ambiguity. Because if you define the limits too too clear, then you kind of um, push the adversary to always attack you below the threshold that yeah. you have uh, have defined. Uh, this is why also Article Five in NATO is not defined. It's a political decision taken on a case by case basis, and it was invoked only once after 9/11, something that was not envisaged by the founding fathers of the Washington Treaty. So. Uh, let me think. There is a good part uh, in in this, because uh, uh, for a while there was a sense that um, uh, the um, uh, let's say the, the, the wrongdoers uh, were not finger pointed. Um, I have to tell you that uh, up until 2014 or so, there was not much public political attribution of cyber attacks vis-a-vis -vis oh. another country, vis-a-vis -vis China or Russia or yeah, so on. Yeah, yeah. Things happened, especially after 2016, after the US election and so on. So this in itself helps put a pressure on the adversary and make him think twice in acting with, uh, with impunity. Secondly, uh, drawing some lines uh, are important because indeed those sectors are um, vital for a society, for, for an economy. And I think the implicit message was that if you do something in these sectors, probably we can do the same. That, that's, that's, that's deterrence. That's how it, um, uh, uh, how it works. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would take it as the following. I think uh, it was good to draw some lines in the sand. Yeah. It's essential that uh, if anyone crosses the line he, he pays for it, he or she pays for it, the attacker pays for it, because you know how it is, you, you, you establish a line and then uh, 
remember Syria and, and so on, uh, no, no use of chemical weapons, and then they were used and nothing happened in, in, in a previous administration. So it's important that if anyone crosses the lines, uh, he, um, he pays a price, there's a cost to pay for this. And I think in the future, uh, there's, there should not be any inhibition to add to that list of 16. Why not? Let's start with 16 that are vital, but add upon them because otherwise, indeed, you will uh, tempt the adversary to, or to, to, to be safe with those ones and jump in the other direction. So yeah. I will take it as an evolutionary process. I see. And, um, Virgil, when you had, we've been talking about in the stream, we've been talking about government preparedness and contrasting the two. Who's worse off or who's better off? Generally, the private sector in the United States, there you sit in the United States, or, or, the, or the governmental sectors where we see in the United States as all kinds of uh, state, city, regional um, operations, governmental things that seem vulnerable and always seem to be attacked. The list seems to go on whenever you open the newspaper. As between private sector and governmental sector, Who's safer these days? Yeah. Does, do uh, we know? Basically, uh, let me mention that in both areas, government and industry, yeah. you find very safe organizations and you find very weak organizations. Okay. So there's a continuum. Uh, for example, in the government, you have very safe organizations in the defense area, which do not use commodity systems. Yeah. They don't use the systems that you and I use. Right? They build special system for special applications with special evaluations. Uh, and many of us don't even know how they are evaluated, but they are evaluated very thoroughly and they are not accessible from the internet. On the other hand, in the government area, you may have systems which are completely uh, unprepared to respond to an external attack. For example, in 2013, there was the uh, military personnel database system uh, which was attacked by the Chinese. And there, it was attacked by the Chinese who was an, uh, exploiting a flaw which Microsoft knew since 1991, mm. right? And they emptied the military personnel database system. And the attack was called Pass the Hash. And I know a lot of details about this because at the time, IBM has sent me to Microsoft to negotiate the security features of then so-called OS2, and this was a big problem, which I pointed out to them. Guess what? In 2013, I was sitting on this board of uh, uh, security, trustworthy security computing at Microsoft. They explained the attack. Uh, they explained that it was past the hash. I pointed out to them that they knew about it since 1991, and they said, no, 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 no. It was 1989 that we knew about it, but we couldn't do anything about it because it propagated. Okay? so. Use commodity systems in some military domains, be prepared to be attacked. Military personal database completely empty. OPM completely emptied of data by the Chinese. Okay, clearly it was a Chinese attack. Now, industry, uh, as Ambassador Ducaro mentioned, there are aspects of the banking systems which are highly secure. And unfortunately, however, even those highly secure systems end up deteriorating because management changes. So one of the most secure uh, areas of banking, one, I can even give you the name of the bank, which was extremely secure 10, 15, uh, 20 years ago. That was Citibank, when they invested a lot in security. Well, management changed, they cut costs, and they are less secure than they used to be uh, at, at this time. So, so again, you have highly secure systems, you have insecure systems in both areas, and you have degrading systems if people don't pay attention. I right, see. So did I catch you right early in the conversation? You said there's one organization that actually knows reliably who the guilty one is. Is that a, is that a secret you keep in the back pocket? No, or? no, no, no. It's quite clear. That's the National Security Agency. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, by the way, it's not just uh, what they employ for attribution is not just... Uh, cyber sensors. They employ yeah. all sorts of sensors. Uh, they employ signal sensors, uh, space sensors to actually pinpoint uh, who did it. And they employ human intelligence. They employ all sorts of things. So now it's too expensive to do it on a large scale, but can they do it? Yeah. Are we willing to pay for them to do it every day and every minute? No. 
Shireen, I want to add... jump. May I jump in on? on, no, go, on ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Because um, it's an interesting point. Um, yes, indeed, uh, attribution um, is a is a difficult um, issue. But uh, when um, there is a blending between, you know, cyber signals intelligence with human intelligence, one can get quite accurate um, uh, attribution, and that's actually the uh, the way to um, uh, to do it. Um, Virgil mentioned uh, the U.S. National Security uh, Agency. I, I would say that uh, there are more um, agencies uh, in the world. I, I don't think that it's only uh, NSA that covers everything. Uh, let, let's put it different, differently. I think uh, in the attack vis-a-vis -vis the National um, uh, Democratic Committee uh, in 2016, uh, it, it was uh, actually uh, another agency from another country that made the link yeah. um, between, I mean, they really pointed to the persons that have been involved because somehow they, they, they got connected to the, uh, everyone knew the institution that was behind the attack, yes? But the, there was a foreign agency, not a US one, that pointed to the persons involved because they somehow succeeded to enter into the surveillance cameras, the security cameras of that building. So they knew who was entering, who was getting in, getting on on a daily basis and so on. And it's also this cooperation between different um, uh, nations. Uh, um, and um, uh, also, uh, I would say the other factor that makes uh, attribution get even more accurate, um, uh, it's also the public private, or, or let's say that the cooperation between industry uh, and, uh, and governments. Uh, I should say that um, when there are big attacks, it's usually the industry that can come with quite a good attribution very, very fast. It's not 100%, but it's above 80%, about 85 or so on. And then it takes a long time to get to the 95, 99, to what people in intelligence called, uh, um, uh, you know, very, very uh, reliable. Um, uh, High confidence. Intelligence. Yeah, How, confidence, yes. High confidence. High confidence, exactly, reliable intelligence. So, so it, like, like always, it's a combination of time and resources involved. And those resources could be technical up to human from one country or from more countries. The more things uh, are integrated, uh, the better um, one can uh, zoom in uh, to, towards this attribution. When you're talking there about NSA, you made the point, Serene, that there are many other you know, spy chiefs working on the good side of this equation. And I mentioned earlier colonial. And I remember with the colonial thing, I think they, were, they had to pay 5 million, something like 5 million. And then I read also that they sort of got the money back, which seemed to indicate they found a back door into the uh, payment that was done, I guess, to a cryptocurrency that seems to indicate that uh, they have really advanced there. Virgil, have they advanced? Tell us about the fact that Colonial got most of their money back. And it seems like they got a back door into the cryptocurrency which is often used for all kinds of illegal purposes. Well, uh, yes, you are absolutely right. Colonial paid in Bitcoin about five million, five million dollars. They got the Bitcoin back, and we'll mention vaguely what we know about it. Yep. But they Bitcoin dropped in value <laughs> in between, and they recovered technically only about half of that. But they got all the Bitcoin back. So the question is, how did it happen? Uh, I can assure you, it wasn't Colonial who recovered it. It yeah. was the FBI was the aid of several other agencies huh? that hacked the attackers' systems. But by the way, it wasn't the people who technically designed the attack. It was the people who employed the attack. Very different groups, by the way. The, the system of the attackers were hacked. The Bitcoins were uh, removed uh, and uh, were returned to Colonial. So that's basically the story. It wasn't Colonial. It was the US government who did that. Right. And that, what that means is first there was attribution. They, they had to figure out exactly who did it because yeah. you have to find the Bitcoin, you have to find right. their systems. Mm -hmm. And they had very precise attribution, number one. 
Number two, they did not wait to produce evidence for that attribution to any court of law. They did go in, they recovered the Bitcoin, they returned it. That was a demonstration exercise and nothing more than that. That's not going to happen every day. It's going to happen only in rare cases. But the point of attribution, which uh, Ambassador Dukaru mentioned is extremely important because sometimes you have attribution is very high confidence and you cannot release the evidence of that attribution to a court of law, which makes life very difficult. But that's what happened in the Bitcoin colonial pipeline case. Well, and by the way, one more, one more point. One more point. What the press tells you, oh, uh, the FBI or whoever hacked the system because they used the wrong password, the weak password. Uh, that was complete nonsense. It was something that the press somebody leaked this to the press and it was the wrong information. It was not as simple. Do you think that the FBI knows more about breaking into the adversaries' computers and effectively being able to uh, return ransom payments? Do they know more than we know and they just don't want to say because they want to use that effectively here and there? In other words, are we breaking more cases than we know? Oh, well, I don't know if we are breaking more cases than we are, but certainly they have the capabilities to do it. And it's not just the FBI, but it's, it's yeah. basically the FBI in conjunction with the other, uh, perhaps 16 intelligence agencies in, in the right. US government, they could, they could actually do it, but it's too expensive to do it on an everyday basis, as Ambassador Dukaru mentioned. Uh, Ambassador hey, Dukaru, can are you, ask, yeah, go on. Are you able to take a couple of questions, John? Go ahead. Go ahead. So um, we have a question from Radu Tudor, uh, who's asking, are cyber attacks part of the hybrid war that the East launched against the West? Um, and another question is, should we try to avoid Chinese hardware and software products for fear of spyware or cyber attacks like TVs or TikTok? Okay, so let me take that first one. Is cyber warfare part of the strategies for uh, the East uh, particularly the Chinese to attack the West. Most definitely, most definitely it's the case. And by the way, the other way around is also the case. I mean, cyber warfare is part of the West arsenal in attacking uh, infrastructures in Eastern countries. So it goes both ways. There's no question about it. Uh, now, the uh, second part of the question is about Chinese products. Well, that is a very difficult question to answer, but let me give you an example. Uh, which is very telling. In 2012, uh, I gave a seminar, a one week long seminar to the Defense um, uh, Development Research and Development Organization in India of the Indian government, like the NSA and DARPA combined. And one of the things the, the government came and said, look, we'd like to buy this Chinese router, routers produced by Huawei. Uh, they are cheap, they are good, they are performant, but we are afraid, afraid that they are hacked, that their hardware is hacked. Can you help us go around it? And of course, I had a, uh, a way to tell them of how to have their cake and eat it too. <laughs> use the Huawei, uh, even if they're hacked, they could actually use them securely. Anyway, the point is that the idea of Chinese products being hacked is not new, it's old, and it's not only, it's not US manufactured. This was discovered in India, not in the US. Now, that's one aspect of the problem. Why is it difficult? What if I say I work for the uh, major US company and I plant a device, a surreptitious device in a Chinese product, which is Chinese cell, through a supply chain modification. So the product leaves China intact and by the time it gets to the US or Russia or whatever, it's hacked by me. I'm a competitor. The Chinese will say, it wasn't us, correctly. And who was it then? Is it a way to besmirch the producer? Okay, so uh, I would be very careful with, not with the detection of hacked Chinese products, because there are quite a lot of them which are indeed hacked and hackable but I'd be careful with saying who did it. Again, attribution. Uh, Luca, do you have another uh, question there? Uh, th this is all for now, thank you. Okay, 
Um, I want to go back to Ambassador DeCarlo there. In terms of national security issues, or, you know, we have uh, obviously some people think that viruses are a big national security. We're living in COVID, and, uh, and that's probably a top on everybody's agenda. But people talk about a conventional war, nuclear proliferation, and so forth and so on. Do you think that the question of cyber threats is placed at the right level in the concerns of governments at a European level right now? Um, I think this, this issue uh, has uh, really been risen on, on the top of um, strategic priorities, both in the US and in Europe uh, in, in the last couple of years, and definitely even before the, uh, the pandemic. Um, you can uh, look at a couple of uh, national security strategies, including the US, um, how, how much this has jumped uh, um, from being, uh, I don't know, maybe in the top 10, but at the bottom of the top 10 to in the first um, uh, three, four uh, key, uh, key areas. So yes, uh, in, in terms of acknowledgement, uh, it's there, it's clear. When you ask me uh, in terms of what is happening in terms of um, uh, taking measures and investing in this, in, in this um, I, I do think uh, that um, it's, it's still um, not clearly not, not enough. Now, I know it's hard because there's always, there's always priority in terms of where to invest first. Is it like the real, a virus like COVID, or is it like the cyber yeah. uh, viruses, and uh, and so on? Um, some um, invest. It's not just about the volume of money that it's put into the issue. It's also the approach, the strategy of how to to use this money. And um, I think it was um, the former U.S. Um, NSA um, uh, director. Um, 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 Mike um, Rogers, Rogers, exactly, who, who, who said that uh, about 90% of cyber attacks could be uh, uh, averted with not so significant and costly measure. They, they come from elementary cyber hygiene, from educating um, uh, people of how to use, how to upgrade software, how to patch when patches are, how to use software and so on, uh, companies, how to uh, uh, elementary aspects of how to build networks and so on. And then the 10% have to be solved by an agency like an NSA or, or, or so on. So uh, I, I think uh, we are still uh, in the area that uh, we are, we are throwing the tablets and the phones and the computers to our kids without teaching them basic cyber hygiene. We are teaching them other kinds of hygiene um, and, and so on, which is great, it's good, but more has to be um, done. Uh, next step, I mentioned you, to you the certification of uh, products right. and, and systems. So. Um, we are, we are better off in terms of approach than five years ago, but compared to the magnitude of the threat and vulnerability, you know, the threat is what's coming against us. So what, what the bad guys are preparing for us and the vulnerabilities is what we are, you know, have uh, inoculated ourselves by doing unsafe or, or working with unsafe systems. Compared to these two elements, uh, it's not enough. Um, you did mention the thing about money, and I know that the Biden administration earmarked, I think, about $10 billion to improve cybersecurity. Is that more or less what Europeans are doing? But more importantly, is there disputes among Europeans on how to deal with it? You're corralling many different national points of view. Is it difficult to get a consensus? And, uh, and, and, and what's the level of contribution from the Europeans? I, 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 cannot, I cannot give you an aggregate figure because they're like budgets for different agencies. I, I, I told you that there is an agency that establishes the certifications, ENISA. Now yeah. there's this new agency on developing cybersecurity innovation in, in Romania, which is just built up as we speak. There are other initiatives on resilience, which include cyber resilience. And mm -hmm. Romania has actually launched a NATO EU 
uh, initiatives on resilience. Now, if you add all the resources that are placed to this, probably uh, it, it's quite significant. Uh, so, but I, I, I don't have the figure right now. I can respond more clearly to the second question. Yeah. Um, there is, um, I would say there's, there's much, there, there's quite a good consensus of what, how, how to uh, prioritize because it's this consensus that generated the decision to develop, for example, cybersecurity innovation and so on. And it wasn't a, like a, a big fight. You did not hear the heads of state uh, staying overnight in a, a budget discussion. There were other issues that are much more uh, controversial from migrations or you know stories like this. Uh, I think on, on, on cyber and how to address it, there's much more convergence, um, and this is a good news. Um, Virgil, going back to the technology and back to the scientific side, if you look at what's going on from, mid, mid, let's say, the Chinese side, the North Korean side, the Iranian side, in terms of these intrusions in our infrastructure, uh, Western Europe and the United States, and then you look at the efforts of the NSA, the FBI, and so forth, how do you figure out, how do you figure who's winning this right now? Are we slipping behind and they're slipping ahead? What's your view on that? So uh, winning from the point of view of an adversarial attack. Yes. Um, look, there is absolutely no doubt that, uh, that these are opportunistic attacks launched from North Korea, Iran, Russia, uh, China, Israel, sometimes the US, these are opportunistic attacks. Now, uh, that does not mean that, uh, that we are less prepared to attack others than others attack us. In fact, uh, I'm absolutely confident that the top three countries in terms of attacks are by far the US, Russia, China, Israel, and then far, far, far beyond North Korea and, and Iran. So, uh, so we are not less prepared to attack others. We are probably better prepared to attack anybody else. The point is that it's not clear that our losses will not mount in the future because the effect of our attacks, monetary losses against North Korea and Iran are minuscule, yeah. right? But the effect of their attack against us are major. Uh, one more point, uh, the cost of cybersecurity attacks globally, and a lot of this money comes from the United States and Western Europe, globally is now in the trillion category. Remember what Senator Dix Dirksen Everett Dixon in Illinois used to say, uh, a billion here and a billion there. Previously, you are talking about real money. We are now talking about the trillion. Yeah. So in, in 2018, as an example, the cost, global cost of cybersecurity was somewhere between half a trillion and one trillion. Now it's between one in 2020, between one and three trillion. Of course, it matters who counts, but we are talking about trillions. That's what prompted people's attention. We are talking about over 1% of the, the total GDP. So, so it's not just us in the West, namely Western Europe and the US. It's also people who are using cyber systems in the East who have to be aware that these are significant costs against that. They'll become- uh, Ambassador Caro, when um, we're talking about, you, know, you, you understand but didn't want to mention countries by name and so forth and all kinds of things like that but you see i can i'm not a diplomat so. well, i was going to ask you the question so i'll let's, let him answer this one i'll ask you the question and the question was this is the, are the western countries working with russia to ferret out smoke out um my my, my the hackers who are operating on russian soil is there a collaboration at a government level to say look you say these guys, the, the Soviet, the Russian government often says these guys are acting on their own. Some people say they're being provided safe harbor. They certainly never say they're behind it. But does the Western, do the Westerners and the Russians get together to smoke out those people who are launching attacks from Russia, so-called independent? No, that I know, not that I know. Right. I, I, I don't know that it's happening. And uh, let me put it this way. Uh, some uh, state actors uh, uh, 
would like to keep some proxy yeah. uh, players uh, operating because um, uh, they are giving uh, them an extra layer of deniability when it comes to an attack and to, to attribution. Uh, there was an article in the Financial Times some years ago um, uh, which was uh, comparing this to the uh, privateering um, during the Queen Elizabeth where some of the, you know, some of the uh, pirates activities were um, with the blessing of the crown. Uh, and of course, there are some legendary figures uh, there and so on. Now, of course, this is a symbolic uh, uh, com comparison, but um, uh, yes, it, 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 it's some, some, some uh, uh, like to, to have, uh, uh, I would say, non-state uh, or even commission non-state uh, players uh, in order to perform specific actions for this extra uh, deniability element, but I responded to you straightforward. I, I do not know that there is any uh, cooperation no, between uh, U.S. or Russia or other, on on. The Virgil, on. I go back to you. You have tenure. You've run a lab and so forth. So maybe you can be a little more forthcoming on the question of Russia and China or U.S. North Korea. Um, where do you see most of this trouble coming from? Where do you point the finger? Well, uh, so trouble came from both sides, but for different reasons from both yeah. Russia and China. And then the, the Russian attacks have come in two, uh, two flavors. Mm -hmm. One was attacks against you know, government operation, disinformation, elections, uh, influence operations, which have been with Russia since time immemorial, since the Cheka days, yeah. right? Since Felix Derzhinsky's days. And the other flavor, that came from Russia where this hack, so-called hacker attacks, patriotic hackers, yeah. right? Who hack presumably independently of uh, the uh, Russian government, which is of course a question. So those were the, the two types that came from Russia. The Chinese have not launched, uh, at least that we know of so far, uh, economic type of attacks, direct economic attacks. If you don't think of theft of in intellectual property being economics. Yeah. So they were involved in theft of intellectual properties to no end the Chinese, but also theft of personal information, mm -hmm. which would eventually lead to attacks against uh, uh, organizations and people. So uh, yes, so they came from both sides, um, but okay. with different purposes. Uh, would you say, um, uh, Serene, this must be one of the most difficult jobs you've had. It's certainly the most cutting edge in the way. Is this the most difficult job you've had in this career, managing this on behalf of the Europeans? Uh, which one, the cyber issue? Yeah. Well, let me put it this way. Um, my, uh, I, I, my, the management of the cyber issue was one of my top responsibility when I was working at NATO. I so I, I, I was uh, uh, the head of the Emerging Security Challenges Division and cyber was uh, on top of the uh, emerging challenges and uh, um, you know it was under my watch and cyber defense uh, was linked to collective defense and article five and then also cyber was declared an operational domain, uh, a, a, a domain of military operations. Uh, now uh, in the current job in the EU, um, you know I'm heading the European Union Satellite Center uh, and um, of course, cybersecurity is a, is a key part because we're speaking about uh, managing huge amount of data. The satellite center is focused on Earth observation, but also space observation, focusing on the debris, uh, you know, avoiding collisions, monitoring re-entries, and, and so on. So all these means data from multiple sensors. Now, if this data is... Uh, distorted, disrupted, it, it, it's hacked, everything falls apart. So um, uh, cyber uh, uh, security is a key part um, of uh, the operation activity that uh, I'm focusing right now. And um, I'm also uh, still academically involved with this uh, aspect. Uh, I, I am um, uh, teaching uh, at the Rome Defense College, uh, at the Bucharest uh, University, guest lectures also at Harvard or, or in Europe. And um, I'm also um, 
part of the um, uh, board, advisory board of the NATO Center of Excellence in, in Tallinn. Uh, right. So it's still very, very close to, to, uh, to my intellectual and academic interest. And by the way, before being a diplomat, I used to be a computer science engineer. My first degree is in computer science. Uh, Maybe I should ask you the my second degree is in uh, political science. Uh, and the master's a couple of years after after the Allen curtain uh, fell. So after my studies in Amsterdam. So it's not by chance that I'm fascinated by the impact of technology upon security and all the strategic aspects that it involves. Maybe I made a mistake by aiming my questions uh, separately for both of you. No, 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 no. Virgil, back to you for a second. Are you still heavily involved? And where's your position now in terms, you ran this lab, you were long time, distinguished at Berkeley and elsewhere. Are you still involved? What, what are you doing now in this? So in this I am at the, uh, thank you for the question. I am at the stage of my life when I can do a lot of research on my own with maybe a postdoctoral student or two. Uh, I teach and I work on very hard problems. So one of them, uh, a very specific small problem of cybersecurity, I could solve unconditionally. So it's the first security problem solved unconditionally, meaning no secrets are used, no limits on the adversary computational power, and no specialized trusted hardware modules. So there is hope. <laughs> well, that, that's I'm, a, free to, uh, I'm free to do research on my own. <laughs> well, that's a perfect spot to be in. Uh, well, Luke, are there any questions hanging there? We just went a little bit beyond the hour, but uh, do you have anything you want to pop in at this point? No more questions. Uh, uh, this is a fascinating conversation, and uh, I wish we could uh, go go on for uh, well, a, a few, few more hours. hours. Think, uh, the people have to, <laughs> I, I mean, really, I think uh, you have to get going in your day, Virgil, and and probably you have to go to dinner, Serene, where you are. But I want to thank you because it's fantastically interesting and very enjoyable, and it's terrific having uh, two Romanians in different parts of the world so well informed on on all, all aspects of the issue. Thanks very much. Thank you, and it was a really a, a great pleasure to be on board with you and uh, and Virgil. Uh, it um, uh, brought a lot of great memories from my time in the U.S. It was good to see Virgil on screen again, hopefully, and you, of course, John. So uh, hopefully we'll see each other also in person soon. Thank Terrific. you, likewise. Likewise. Okay.